who will tell us more about kind of the, the real world of non-equilibrium in condensed matter materials. Hello, yeah, okay, at least. Uh, so it's, it's a pleasure to be here, and I thank the organizers for, uh, for uh, inviting me to, to, to show you something uh, from the real world, as uh, Zala put it. So the idea uh, is that uh, 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 first, I, I need to, do a, to, to, to have a disclaimer in the sense that uh, this uh, seminar would suit better probably the topics of next week, but that's uh, to be blamed on me and not to the organizers because originally they invited me for next week, but I couldn't come, so I, I have to anticipate this. Okay, so I will, uh, they asked me to give an introductory talk on uh, uh, what, um, uh, what are the experimental approaches to non-equilibrium physics. So I will be very basic, and as for the other speakers, please interrupt me anytime to, and ask any question that may come. To you. So, uh, what is the idea of what we do? We, I stick with this, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, our uh, interest is uh, complex quantum materials. So, complex quantum materials are those where the macroscopic functionality is determined by the non-trivial interplay between the different matter constituents. So, like spin, electrons, uh, or uh, a, any kind of material degree of freedom is at play, and the interaction between the different degrees of freedom is the key to understand uh, a given functionality. And we take, uh, and, and this, this interaction essentially is the interaction which gives rise to, uh, some of you may know this phase diagram, to very intricate phase diagram. This is just one example, and this is the phase diagram of high temperature superconductors where the, the delicate interplay between the different matter constituents give rise to systems which can have very different functionalities changing only by a small amounts a given control parameter. So what we do in order to understand the physics of those systems, it's uh, to bring them out of equilibrium, and what's the idea? The simple idea is that whenever you have like uh, all the degrees of freedom interacting as a, 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 in a non-trivial way, the idea is to take one of these degrees of freedom out of equilibrium and by looking at the relaxation dynamics, we try to understand what are the leading physical mechanisms in the systems. And the purpose of this seminar essentially is to give you a little bit of an overview. I think, uh, yeah, 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 thanks. Hello, is it better? Yeah? Thanks. Yeah, so I think that nearly all of you are theorists, so I, I, I try just to give a, a, an overview, very simple, of what can be done in the lab. The purpose of this seminar is to bore you with uh, some details of what can be done so that you at least are aware of what uh, can be done in the real world, as Zala put it. I like that, uh, that formulation. And just stop me anytime. So we want to study the dynamics, and the first thing that we need to do whenever we want to do dynamics, you need to understand at which uh, length and time scale you want to study the dynamics. And this is, of course, like a, a very simple sketch of, of different uh, size that we uh, have to think about. And the, 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 the energy at which we want to see the dynamics is, is actually associated to the time scale, and this time scale is associated to uh, 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 also to the temperature. So, for instance, if we want to see phase transition, which are dominated by certain degrees of freedom, we need to look in a certain frequency range. And the, 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 the frequency range which is of our interest is the frequency range which we can access here in these like two uh, very general settings where I just highlight uh, what can typically, what are the laser source that we can have with tabletop sources, which are in the visible near and far infrared. And uh, to go to higher energy, we need uh, large-scale facilities, the synchrotron and the FEL. And that allows us to study 
the degrees of freedom that I mentioned before, which are the dominant degrees of freedom in matter. So, for instance, how vibration affect the dynamical response of a system, how magnetic excitation and how electronic excitation can, can determine these physical properties. So the range that we are interested in is the range in which we want to study how uh, phonons and, and uh, spin excitation or free electrons in materials evolve in time. So we need uh, spectroscopies which are in the time scale, which is 10 to the 12, 10 to the 15, 10 to the, to the 18 seconds, which actually means uh, a one billionth of a, a billion of a second. So basically, this we start from time scales which are three times as fast, uh, sorry, three orders of magnitude faster than the fastest electronics that you have in the lab. How do we access this time scale? Well, the, 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 the known techniques, which I assume most of the people in this crowd have heard of, is the technique of pump and probe, where we used very short light pulses, so light pulses which we can relatively easily produce. To, and they are as short as uh, some tens of femtoseconds. And we use them typically in pairs so that we use one pulse to induce a dynamical response in the material and the second pulse to go and measure at a given delay how this material evolves in time. And they, as I said before, the general, the, the typical time scales on which we, we study the, res the dynamical response of our system is of the order of 10 to the minus 15, 10 to the minus 14 seconds. So, the technique to do, it's a, this is just a very general idea of pump and probe spectroscopy. So essentially, we use light on one hand to perturb the material and on the other hand to measure the material. And this general scheme of perturbing and measuring, it actually a, a comes nowadays in many different forms. And just a, a, so that I, I, I make a, a, a young theorists aware of this, essentially there's a, a, a fairly large community which by now developed most of the standard equilibrium spectroscopic probes that you could have, they are available in a non-equilibrium version. So essentially you have techniques in which you can measure all the optical properties of your uh, uh, materials, but also you have techniques where you can perturb the material and measure the X-ray response, so you have also access to the structural dynamics in your matter. Or eventually, you can also have techniques, you can use the same concept of pump and probe, where you use a photo excitation, but your observable is not photons, but it's electron out, and that's called time resolved angle, time and angle resolved electron, photoelectron spectroscopy, which tells you what are the electronic state in the material, and even you can even use bunches of electron so that you can measure time resolved electron diffraction. So this is just a, like a, a, very, a very short uh, rollover, many different techniques which are available, but essentially I would argue that you can measure on a sub picoseconds time scale uh, most of the uh, uh, electronic properties that you can measure at equilibrium, and at the same time you can also measure the structural dynamics uh, 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 by measuring X-ray and electron diffraction or by measuring uh, uh, imaging at the microscopic scale. So essentially, the idea is that you can, uh, you can access non-equilibrium thermodynamics in full so that uh, there's, there's a, a, a whole lo lot of available spectroscopy that now can, can give a lot of answers on the dynamical response on complex materials. So, this is to focus on what can we measure. So whenever you do pump and probe, the idea is that you use light to perturb and light to measure. And I've shown that essentially we have available most of the observables nowadays. But also what is key in, in my opinion is how do, what, what are the degrees of freedom that we can drive so that essentially you can also ask yourself in all these dynamical probe of matter, I always use photo excitation as a tool to drive matter out of equilibrium. And what are the degrees of freedom in matter? Or what are the degrees of freedom that I can drive? I essentially, I have to control the photo excitation entirely. And just to give a, a little bit of, of a, a taste of what, what, what you can do whenever you perturb in this framework matter, you always use light. So you use light in very short pulses, and this is like a sketch 
of uh, an electromagnetic pulse. So what can you change? You can change uh, many of the standard properties. For instance, you can change at which wavelength you drive the material, how long is your pulse, or you can even shape your pulse to some extent. All the classical driving parameters are nowadays relatively easily accessible, and I'll show you how they are relatively easily accessible. But there are also more subtle quantities which I can change. For instance, I can change what is the uh, relative phase between the envelope and the phase of the field. These are also things that we can control nowadays. Or eventually, I can try to use the statistical properties of light. So I can even try to encode information in the quantum state of the light and retrieve a spectroscopic information from the measurement of the quantum state of the light. And the idea of this uh, first part of the introductory seminar is just to give uh, a little bit of a snapshot uh, on what do we do experimentally that uh, maybe I'll be probably too trivial, but just uh, so that you have an idea of what we can do. Okay. So this is the, the way I structured this presentation. So in the first part, I will give you just uh, a, a, a very general introduction to non-equilibrium non optical spectroscopy. I'll go very fast in the sense that I'll just give you some tools, the tools that we have in the lab so that you, you understand uh, what, what, uh, what kind of experiment we can run, how do we run it, and then I'll focus on one observable, optical spectroscopy, and show you how we, have, uh, we can use this optical spectroscopy to unravel dynamical response. In the second part, if I'll have time, instead I will go into something which is dearer to us, so, to us, so something which is more related to the scientific program that we actually are running now. So the first part is mostly educational, where I will cite old works, the second part it's uh, just to give you a, a, a snapshot of what are the kind of problems that we are facing now. And essentially, we have gone over the 10 years or 20 years time, we have gone from the idea of measuring the dynamical response of the material to the idea of controlling the dynamical response of the material. And we leverage on the knowledge that we acquire through the spectroscopy to try to understand what are the key aspects that we can drive in matter and what kind of uh, uh, effects we can obtain. So what is, uh, well, how do we produce short pulses? Well, the, the idea is that uh, uh, we, will, uh, we, we have relatively easily accessible sources of ultra short pulses, so pulses which are uh, as long as uh, 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 10 to the minus 14 seconds, 10 to the minus 15 seconds, and then we need a lot of frequency conversion and we need a lot of control of amplitude and phase of the spectral component. So what are the sources? The general concept which, uh, which uh, uh, it's applied to all the, 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 the sources that we essentially use in the lab is the concept of mode locking. So that essentially we take a laser cavity, we make it laser on a, a very broad uh, wavelength range, and then we design our cavity so that the cavity is uh, it's, uh, it's do it has exactly the same length uh, for all the spectral component. And once we, we do this, we can uh, uh, favor, through some uh, nonlinear interaction, a lasing which is pulsed, so I can generate very short light pulses. This is all I will tell about the sources, because there's a, a full technology field there which uses these concepts in, in a very broad way. So this would be, subject, would be the subject to a, a full seminar by itself. Then how do we convert the frequency? Generally, we start from very short pulses. The advantage of short pulses is that we, can, we cluster all the energy in a very short time, so the fields are very intense, and therefore nonlinearities are very strong. And if I have non -li uh, strong nonlinearities, I can relatively easily convert the frequency of our pulses. So one of the, the, the typical tricks that we use, we use the fact that the response of Gen normal crystals, they, are, uh, they can have nonlinear components, and this is an example in which the nonlinear interaction drive uh, the radiation into very tiny cha uh, channels. So essentially, the nonlinear interaction makes such that the radiation propagates into this material into very narrow filament. And if, the, if I can reach this regime, I can actually use the, a similar nonlinearity essentially, again, a, 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 an index of refraction which depends also on the intensity of the light 
to generate different spectral components so that I can actually start from a light pulse which has certain frequency component and by reaching a strong nonlinear regime, I can actually introduce a, 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 a other spectral components. So essentially I can destroy photons at, at a given frequency and create photons at different frequencies so that I can frequency convert my laser. Again, this is uh, one uh, a very one rolling over one of the methodology that we can use, but essentially we can use nonlinear optics in all in, in in many different forms to produce light pulses with very specific properties. Most importantly, uh, we can also produce like we start from pulses which has a which have a, a relatively narrow spectral component, and we produce pulses which have a very sp broad spectral component. And if you need a, a good picture for the web page, this is the kind of picture that we can produce so that we can shine a infrared light on some nonlinear crystal. And after the nonlinear crystal, du due to the strong nonlinearities, I obtain light which has all the spectral components of this kind. So, the other process which we often use, it's called optical parametric amplification, which is also used in quantum information. We use it in a fully classical regime. Essentially, we try to go to a, a, a saturation so that we can have a very stable sources. And uh, some colleague of mine called this like uh, the, the, the photon cutter. So essentially, it's a process which can take a photon at one frequency and convert it into two photons of different frequencies so that if I manage to have like phase matching condition, I can produce a, a different frequency in general. So we use this uh, process in, in, in many different forms. The typical experiment, this is like a conceptual design of an optical parametric amplifier. The typical experiment is an experiment in which we produce a tiny bit of the spectral component that we want to amplify in one nonlinear process, and then in a second nonlinear process, we amplify the given spectral component that we want to effectively use in the experiment, and that is the typical conceptual scheme of an optical parametric amplifier that, that we have in the lab. I say conceptual in the sense that uh, this is just uh, the very basic unit, and then depending on what are the frequencies that we want to produce, we, we need to use and to design a nonlinear process in cascades so that we go from the uh, one given frequency from which we start and we can produce all the spectral component in this way. So this is conceptual design and this is effectively real uh, uh, experiments in the lab where we can uh, produce cascade of, of, of nonlinear processes to produce the light pulse that we want. So we use a lot of nonlinear optics and we use a lot of linear optics where we basically uh, shape all the spectral components. So just to, to, to make you aware, again, the spirit of this seminar is mostly making you aware of what can be done. It is relatively straightforward technology nowadays to take light pulses and control separately all the different spectral component in a, in a light pulse and control essentially entirely the shape of these pulses so we can shape the amplitude and the phase of different pulses so that we can produce arbitrary waveform in a relatively easy way. So the, the technology, to summarize the technology that we use, essentially the, 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 the main building block is mod locking, mod lock laser, and then we, we, we use a lot of nonlinear optics to convert to the, to, the frequencies that, and amp, uh, to the frequencies we want, and then we shape uh, through linear manipulation of amplitude and phase of a spectral component. I apologize if I will be a little bit, if I, if I am a little bit uh, uh, tedious, but I just want to, uh, uh, especially because the crowd is mostly theorist, I think it's important to, 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 to make you aware of what can be done so that uh, uh, cross-fertilization between theory and experiments is, uh, is, uh, is viable. So how do we reason about this problem? And the, the, the main aspect is equilibrium optical spectroscopy. So I will go very fast on this because that's uh, essentially what everybody would have seen already at university. So what do we learn from measuring the optical conductivity? In this crowd, op 
people, mo most of the people would use the language of optical conductivity, which is the current current correlation function. But of course, depending, depending on what, which community you are, and this slide has the purpose of avoid confusion, sometimes you, you hear about the electric function, or if you, if you design an optical setup, you hear about the index of refraction, but these quantities are essentially the same. If I, get, if I have the optical conductivity, I can calculate all the, 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 the other properties and vice versa. And uh, going from the uh, 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 intensive property to the extensive property, for instance, of the reflectivity, if I have a sample and I know the optical conductivity, I can calculate the reflectivity. Going from an effective measurement to an intensive quantity requires some, some carefulness, but essentially in optical spectroscopies we have a, a, a a bunch of recipe which allow us from a real measurement to extract quantities which can be directly uh, uh, compared to calculations in terms of optical conductivity. So how do, we, uh, how do we describe this in a functional way? And this is what you learned uh, at the last year of university, probably. It's uh, the dielectric function of, of a material. You can describe it in terms of uh, a Lorentz uh, oscillator model. And the general principle is that uh, if you want to see how a, a cloud of electrons react to a stimuli electric field, you can apply the electric field and you will drive into the system a polarization. And the constant which stays in between the electric field that you apply and the polarization you reach is what we call the susceptibility. So how the electron cloud is susceptible to the applying to the field that we apply. And how do we describe it? Uh, if we want to calculate what is the polarization that we obtain, we just have to solve a, 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 a differential equation in which we try to accelerate charges with an electric field. Charges have a given mass, so there's an acceleration. There's a key element, which is how much do I dissipate energy into the moving of these charges? So uh, a term which is proportional to the speed of the charges. And if the charges are bounded, there is a restoring force which tries to drag them back after I, I resonantly drive. I can solve this equation, just I, 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 I am very trivial here, and I can calculate my susceptibility. And this is the essence of the Lorentz oscillator model. So whenever I have certain bound charges into the material, they will resonate at some specific frequency. So the frequency at at which they resonate is this omega zero, and there will be a dissipation which will tell me how efficiently, if I drive charges in that oscillator, I leave energy into the system. So that's the, that's the general description of the dielectric function. You can plot epsilon one and epsilon two, real and imaginary part. And again, for educational purposes, it should be clear that if I know the, the, the real and, and imaginary part of the optical conductivity, I analytically can go to uh, uh, the dielectric function or to the index of refraction. These are essentially the same quantity. And I can link an intensive property to an extensive one just by measuring the, uh, the reflectivity. So if I know the, the description in terms of the dielectric function of the material, I can be predictive on, of an experiment. So. Uh, uh, how do I introduce, this is true for uh, bound charges, how do I introduce free charges? And here again, I go very fast. It's essentially the, the, the Druder response, which I can describe exactly in the same way as I did for a bound oscillator, but uh, without the restoring force. So I apply a field and I drag around charges and the charges are dissipated, okay? The movement of the charges are dissipated with a given scattering rate and I can calculate the optical conductivity in a material. So essentially, the, 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 a description of the optical conductivity in terms of Lorentz oscillator and uh, through the response, it's, uh, it gives us an intuition, it gives us a, a, a description of what are the bound charges into the material, which are often associated to interband transition between, say, a, a, and what are the free charges which are often associated to 
intraband transition, so the electrons that can move in a metallic state. So this is, for instance, the optical conductivity of a, a, a superconducting cuprates where I, I can clearly see the through the response and all the charge transfer oscillators here. Okay, so these are uh, all uh, standard tools for equilibrium spectroscopy. And uh, the, what does the optical conductivity, again, this is, again, for the students, what is the optical conductivity? I can describe it by introducing bound charges and free charges. And the optical conductivity, essentially, it's telling me if a system is metallic or if a system is insulator. So if uh, it's a finite frequency measurement of the conductivity. And if I have a metal, typically, there is a response at finite frequency which is associated to the free charges, which is not there if, it's, uh, if, the, if there's no free charges in the system. I will see the unscreen phonon mode. Do I really use an experiment? Yes, I can really use it in experiment. For instance, this is a phase transition between an insulator into a metal in one of the prototypical samples that we studied. This is a metal insulator transition at room temperature, and you see that the, the changes in conductivity, conductivity measured in the DC limit, is associated to a change in the conductivity at low frequency, which is described by this through the, through the response. This is just examples of, of different optical conductivity of high temperature superconductors or, or correlated materials, which have all the same structure. One aspect which instead goes a little bit beyond just a very introductory aspect is what happens if I think about a system where the scattering rates depends on frequency, and this is what goes under the name of extended through the model, where essentially I can take the scattering rate which tells me how free electrons scatters with low energy bosons to dissipate energy after I try to move them with, with an electric field which stimulate the movement, and if I introduce a scattering rate which actually depends on frequency, by studying the scattering rate at different frequency, I can retrieve what is the, uh, um, for instance, what is the coupling between the electrons and low energy bosons, for instance, in this case, with this uh, 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 bosonic function. I can retrieve how the electrons, which are driven by a field, dissipate energy. And if I do things carefully, you find uh, some references in this review we wrote, you can uh, look at the uh, spectra, uh, at the dispersion of the phonon modes, which uh, 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 are in your material. These are, for instance, the, the phonon mode in MGB2. And you can calculate, associating that all the phonon will participate to the scattering process of the electrons. I can actually calculate the electron-phonon coupling in this way. And uh, time result, it's, it's, uh, it's good to measure this. So you can actually measure how the electrons dissipate energy and what is the spectra of the bosons which participate to this dissipation of energy. So this is, this is true for equilibrium. So optical spectroscopy can be viewed in this way as a mean to measure dissipations in matter. And uh, the, the standard tool that we use to study non-equilibrium, it's uh, bring the concept of equilibrium spectroscopy to non-equilibrium. So what is the idea? The idea is that whenever we, we, we want to study this complexity, so this, this, I said this complex interaction which gives rise to this very intricate phase diagram, I can always uh, think at the different interactions between different constituents in matter as interactions which are subject to a hierarchy of time scales. So what does the field do? The field drives electrons. So the electrons are directly coupled to the fields. And uh, there is a certain time scale under which the electrons thermalize. And the electrons transfer energy on different degrees of freedom, which are coupled to the electrons on different time scales. And for instance, you can think that the electrons transfer energy to a subset of strongly coupled phonons or bosons in general, and then only at a later time, these bosons are dissipate energy into the rest of the degrees of freedom of the material. So typically, you, you, you use the fact, in, in, in non-equilibrium spectroscopy, you use the fact that uh, 
different interactions appears at different time scales, so that essentially, by studying the relaxation process, you can measure the, the, how the different degrees of freedom interact. And the, the interesting aspect is that if I manage to write this bosonic function, which actually links or tell me how the electrons dissipate energy into the phonon, I can associate the, the, this, uh, this, this response function, which, which I measure at equilibrium, and I can directly measure it out of equilibrium. Because how do I transfer energy from electrons to phonon is governed by, uh, at, uh, with weak perturbation by a linear coupling uh, equation, where the coupling it's also determined by the same bosonic function. So how the electrons transfer energy to the different objects to which they are coupled. So the rationale of using non-equilibrium spectroscopy for studying complex quantum material is exactly the idea that I can, measuring on different time scale, I can dissect in time the different leading interactions. This is true to some extent, and uh, it's true in many systems, and that, that was uh, very successful, for instance, in, uh, to measure electron phonon coupling in simple metals, so that the, the electron phonon coupling is directly related to the speed at which the electrons dissipate their energy. But of course, this is just, for us, it is often only the starting point, in the sense that whenever I write some uh, differential equations in which the different uh, degrees of freedom are coupled, I always assume that uh, they are linearly coupled, first of all, and I assume that uh, the, the, uh, whenever I, I write this coupling function, I always have to give certain assumption of what is the, what is the distribution of energy in the different degrees of freedom. So there's, uh, it, it should be seen, in my, in my opinion, as a, as a good starting point. So whenever in next, next week you will see some some uh, effective temperature models for the description of the system, you should have in mind that uh, you have different buff of electrons, phonons, and spin, which exchange energy. And the, the measuring how they exchange energy can be done by dissecting these dynamics in time. So this is uh, a, a, the, the idea. And of course, there's, there's, there's many limitations. and uh, the, the, the limitation is that uh, often in, in complex material you have a, 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 a free energy landscape with multiple uh, uh, order parameters, so uh, non-trivial energy landscape, so that the dissipations are never linear, so you can have non-linear interactions bet between different degrees of freedom, to the point that you can even observe metastable phases, metastable states, which can be reached only through specific non-adiabatic path which I can control with light. And of course, another aspect which we always throw away, it's to what extent are coherences of the different constituents relevant in determining the dynamics? Because whenever I say I have two thermal buff which exchange energy, I always, uh, if I write an effective equation, I always throw away the, the, the effect of coherences and I use only the diagonal elements of the density matrix. So, this is like uh, the trivial part where we come from, and essentially there's like uh, a, a, a many examples. I just picked one, which is an old example on how coherences are relevant, and this is like uh, 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 the case study for what what was called a coherent phonon response, which is like a classical elastic vibration in the system. It was uh, the study of elemental semi-metal, which are essentially semi-metals, uh, which are elemental crystals in which the physics of one-dimensional pyre systems is at play. So, and uh, just a, 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 a snapshot of what is pyre's physics. So if I have a one-dimensional metallic chain, this metallic chain is unstable for a distortion at the Fermi vector, and that's because the, the, the cost, the energy cost of a distortion is quadratic, while the electronic energy gain is linear with the distortion itself, so that uh, a, a metallic chain is essentially always distorted and unstable. And these elemental semi-metal are just a 3D version due to the specific geometry of these crystals. This one-dimensional physics is at play in a three-dimensional crystal. 
And the idea of time domain studies here is that if I now take a photon which uh, takes away electrons from the conduction band, and so, sorry, from the uh, 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 takes away electrons from the valence band and put them in the conduction band, I essentially reduce the energy gain of uh, having this distortion so that if the re electronic relaxation process is fast, I can actually drive the system towards the undistorted phase. This is like a, a very well known in literature, and this is like it served historically as one of the case study for this kind of physics, where there is like a, a given phonon mode which actually mediates this, uh, this distortion. And if I photo excite the material with a pulse which is shorter than the time scale of the phonon, these are actual real data. So you see that as a function of time, pump and probe delay, I do see very strong oscillations. And these very strong oscillations are associated to the fact that I have a vibrational mode at a given frequency, which uh, uh, coherently uh, evolve in time. So the system here is clearly not in a thermal equilibrium. So understanding how the, the, the atoms in the different uh, phase of the vibration exchange energy with the electron can be done in this way. And uh, uh, one, one standard way is to give a Gisborne Landau description of this process so that you can study what is the frequency of the phonon mode as a function of the electron density that you put into the system. So if you increase the electron density, you reduce the frequency of the phonon mode. So this is like, uh, this was used historically to, to study a, a screening and to study how electronic excitation can screen lattice vibrations in these systems. I'm going very fast <laughs> and very uh, long. OK, so this is the, the, the kind of problem that, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, the field face. And you will see next week a few seminars about it. And uh, one of the aspects is that we, we want to introduce both time and frequency resolution so that we went from an experiment in which I can study the time evolution of some observable into an experiment where for a given observable, I can study the energy response so that I do a full spectroscopic measurement. So for a given spectral component, I can measure the time evolution of the response. Or for a given time, I can measure the, spectral, the spectrally resolved response. And this allowed uh, uh, us and many others in the field to try to understand the time evolution not of simple experimental observables, but the time evolution of physical quantities. And essentially, the idea is that we can use a snapshot of the response as a function of wavelength to measure the, the, the and compare to the equilibrium reflectivity so that the equilibrium reflectivity gives us the uh, optical conductivities. And uh, if I measure in time domain the, the response, how does the response change in a certain frequency region, I can measure how does the optical conductivity change in time. So that essentially I could uh, measure the time domain response of, uh, of, uh, of uh, of physical quantities so that I can measure the time domain response of the term of certain oscillator and uh, measure, dissect the dynamics both in frequency and in time. OK, so this is uh, a, a, what, what can be done. There was here a second example. I will uh, just uh, uh, briefly, uh, I will uh, leave it here. Should I go on 10 minutes more? Or? Because actually, I did, only the, I did only the trivial part. I didn't do the, yeah? So es essentially, that's the, 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 we use this uh, frequency and time resolved response to study how charge transfer excitations is dressed by low energy electronic dynamics. And we choose a system in which uh, uh, we do have a, a clear optical transition. The system is insulating, is lanthanum copper oxide, one of the prototypical ex examples of, of, uh, of uh, 
of uh, high, high temperature superconductors. And uh, e in these systems, we studied how the, the, the charge transfer transition reacts to an excitation which has high photon energy, so an excitation in which the photon has enough energy to promote the effective jump of the electrons between the oxygen to the copper, and we compare it to a situation in which the field is, can be very strong, but the photon energy is not high enough to promote a jump of a charge between oxygen and copper, and therefore I have a sort of adiabatic drive of this transition. I cut a long story short, but essentially this technique allowed us to, to, to study how this charge transfer excitation evolve in time. Here it's, uh, it's uh, the Hamiltonian description of the process, but what, what's interesting of the, I just, uh, yeah, I just, uh, I just wanted to give a snapshot again of the results. So what's interesting is the fact that whenever I have a high frequency field, I can directly couple to the electrons and I can promote the, a transition between different electronic state in the material. And if I can do this, the dissipation acts on a relatively short time scale. So I promote the electrons and the electrons dissipate energy into the pho phonons at the, at the longer time scale. On the other hand, if I drive the electrons with a field which whose photon energy is too low to promote this transition, then the, the, the system tries to accommodate the presence of a strong perturbing field, and it, it accommodates by driving a coherent excitation of the low frequency boson, which is in the problem. So, but the, the, the message here is that I, I have a lot of uh, degrees of freedom in what is the question I ask to the system in the sense that I can drive materials into different states by producing different excitations. And I have a, a, a full army of observables which I can uh, use to, to disentangle or to, dis to, to measure the dynamical response of the material. So this was like a, 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 just a, an introduction <laughs> to, to those uh, who are not familiar to, to non-equilibrium spectroscopy, which I assume is the vast majority of the crowd. So if you have questions, it's a good moment to ask. If you don't have questions, I can, uh, I can avoid killing you with a full uh, seminar on the most advanced topics. Maybe I just give you the taste of what we are doing right now. Yeah? Okay. So. As I said, the idea is that we, we want to move from the idea of just uh, measuring the non-equilibrium response of materials to the idea of controlling macroscopic functionalities. And what do we do? So we, we play this game on complex material essentially for the same reason that I mentioned before that these materials, this complex interaction between the different degrees of freedom give rise to intricated phase diagram. And how do I read an, inter an intricated phase diagram, broadly speaking? I can always think at the system as if the system is always on the verge of a big change of physical property. What does it mean? For instance, in those materials, I just change the temperature a little bit and they go from a superconductor to a bad metal. Or I just change the doping and they go from an insulator to a superconductor. So just a tiny change of some control parameter give rise due to the non-trivial interaction between the metal constituent give rise to macroscopic changes of functionality. And we want to leverage on this to obtain optical control. So the idea is that uh, the system, it's always close to a big change of functionality and you want to use light to obtain functionality which you may not be able to obtain by equilibrium transformation or quasi-adiabatic transformation. So the fact that you can dump energy into specific degrees of freedom allows you to obtain states which are not accessible if I increase the energy adiabatically between all the degrees of freedom of the system. 
So the idea is that photo excitation is a sort of additional control parameter, and you can obtain functionalities which you may have or may not have at equilibrium, so that there's a non-equilibrium uh, uh, physics in these systems, which is actually um, uh, uh, much more rich than the equilibrium ones. So what is the idea? The idea is that if you do have a, 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 I like the way it was recently summarized in this report. So if you do have a different degrees of freedom or a, and a different order parameters in the system, I can use light to go around in, a, in an intricate phase, uh, in, an intri in an intricate free energy landscape in a non-adiabatic way. And these people try to cluster this, this relatively large field of photo-induced phase transition into two different kinds of dynamics. And I try to, to, to give a, a snapshot of uh, an idea of what, what are the two fields. In one sense, you can think of obtaining the control of functionality through dissipative processes. So essentially, by using an electric field, the electric field drives electrons, and the electrons dissipate energy. The energy goes into some specific degrees of freedom, and I can obtain new functionality because I have more energy in one degree of freedom than in the rest. And this comes in, in, in relatively trivial form. For instance, it's called a, a, what I call a thermodynamical transition, in which the dissipation is global in the sense that I, I use the field, the field dump energy into the material, and the material evolves towards its own <coughs> thermodynamic path. On the other hand, you can have dissipative control of something which is a little bit more subtle, because if I use light to inject energy into, into some degrees of freedom, there's no need that this energy is dissipated to the rest of the system. But I can obtain. I, I can, uh, 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 in this uh, complex uh, free energy landscape, I can be locked into some local minimum, which I can access only through non-adiabatic paths. So I can drive the material. The material dissipates the energy in an incoherent excitation of a given degree of freedom. And that locks me, for instance, in metastable states, which have a given functionality which may or may not be there at equilibrium. There are a few examples where this, is, where this has been revealed, and uh, this, is, this is a very interesting uh, aspect. On the other hand, you can think of obtaining a control of functionalities by a direct control of the quantum dynamics in the system. And in this respect, you have already seen examples of uh, how to use Floquet drives. And I'll just give an example here at the end of how we use cavity electrodynamics to control the material functionalities. Okay. But the general idea is that you can either control by using a, a so-called, what I would call the, the diagonal elements of the density matrix of all the different matter constituents. So I, I have uh, some thermal distribution of some degrees of freedom and different temperatures or different energy in the different degrees of freedom. And that allows to obtain a non-trivial thermodynamics. And there's a wealth of, of reported states uh, um, where metastability can be reached. Or eventually, you can think of uh, using light directly as a, control, uh, as a control system for driving functionalities. So some examples on the trivial thermodynamics response. It's, uh, this is like uh, uh, some of our old papers where we've shown that we can induce a metallic state from an insulator. But uh, to the best of our understanding, the dynamics that we observed here was essentially a dynamics where light did nothing really interesting into the system, but just dump energy into the system. And then the system evolved towards its own thermodynamics. And the thermodynamics, when I say its own thermodynamics, I mean that the electrons dissipate the energy. The energy is very suddenly distributed among all the different matter constituents. And then I simply find a sample which, is, which has more energy than the one I started with. And that's the thermodynamics of the response. On the other hand, there's a, a few examples. And this is one of my own contribution, old contributions, in which 
we have shown that photo excitation can even go against thermodynamics. And the example of photoinduced superconductivity, I think it's very interesting in this respect because we have shown that when we shine light onto a non-superconducting system, we can obtain a superconducting state, which essentially, in the ex example I, I, I gave before, it means that I start from a bundle of degrees of freedom which are interacting in a very disordered way by shining light, I obtain a nice pullover because I reduce the entropy into the system. So essentially, I, I, in the electronic state, superconductivity is a low entropy state, so I need to dump the entropy somewhere else. And that actually gave rise to a, a full field of research where there's many theoretical proposals on how this is even possible and to what extent this is possible. And we gave many contributions in this line in trying to understand how we can drive order from this order. Okay. And this is the, this is the essence of what we do in, in different forms. We still try to understand how by driving with uh, ultra short pulses, we can actually reduce the entropy of the system. And uh, a, a, I just show in three slides, one example, in two slides, another, and then I'm done. So one example where we showed that we can drive order from disorder, it's, it's a paper which we published recently in which we wanted to demonstrate that if we take a very specific excitation, so a very specific excitation which is resonant to vibrational modes, we can actually, by resonantly drive phonon, we can control, coherently control, electronic excitation. And if you think about it, this goes somewhat against the born oppenheimer approximation because we always think that the electrons are uh, at adiabatic equilibrium given an atomic position. But what we do in this experiment, we do the opposite because we take a field, we couple to the phonon, and we try to gate electronic transition by driving the structure. So for demonstrating that this was possible, we choose a system in which uh, we do have a very clear evidence of electronic transitions. Here is just a little bit of details, but these are electronic transitions. This is the optical absorption of my material in the visible range. And there's a, a feature which is in literature associated to the presence of crystal field excitations, which is essentially the redistribution of energy between different orbital states on the copper ion, on the copper ion into the system. And this transition should not be allowed optically because they are a delta L equals zero in transition, but they are actually visible in real experiments. And the way they are described in literature is that essentially whenever I try to promote an electron between two different crystal fields, I can not only promote the electrons, but I have to break the symmetry. And what breaks the symmetry is usually that this transition is a phonon assisted transition. So every time I promote an electron between two different crystal fields, a phonon comes into the problem, breaks the symmetry of the problem, and makes this transition allowed. So this is like uh, some, some description of the process in which uh, essentially you, there is a displacement of the structure which uh, uh, makes the transition allowed. And for us, this was the ideal platform because if those transitions are really not allowed unless there's a phonon which comes in, then if we can control the phonon, we can control the electronic transition. And we can go against the born oppenheimer approximation. So the idea of the experiment was simply to take an electric field which resonantly drives some vibrational mode and to measure on-site crystal field transition between different orbital states on the atoms. And what we realized, you find uh, all the details in the paper and in the supplementary information, what we realized is that indeed, if I resonantly drive the structure, I can go against thermodynamics. Because as I said, the, whenever I, these are like the same transition I saw before, just, I, I, just to make it confused, at five o'clock in the afternoon, I swap the axis. So now the energy axis is here, and this is the absorption. And I told that these transitions are allowed only because there's a phonon that participates into the process. And therefore, whenever I turn up the temperature, I increase the thermal disorder, and I make this transition more allowed. 
this is equilibrium observation. While if I drive the, coherently the, the atomic position, I do observe region in which the system is more transparent, so it absorbs less than at equilibrium, which effectively it means that I am coherently controlling the atomic position, which is equivalent to cooling certain degrees of freedom of the material which participate into this absorption. So essentially, I, I can cool fluctuations in one specific degrees of freedom, which makes this transition uh, uh, allowed. So this is, a, this is an example. So like this was an example of, of vibrationally induced transparency, where uh, we, it, it is clear that we went uh, against thermodynamics. And these are the kind of problems that, in my opinion, they are they are the most interesting one because you have the complexity of the system and the interaction between the different degrees of freedom which allow you to do much more than you could do with adiabatic transformation if you use a light pulse. Because taking a light pulse, you can dump energy or coherently drive specific degrees of freedom so you can move around in an intricate energy landscape in a much more controlled way than just by turning on the temperature, the global temperature of the system. So th there's a few examples of this. This is another example. I, I will skip the details. So I, I will skip this example. But uh, the, the, the idea of measuring fluctuation is crucial here in the sense that I told you before that if I have an observable which can map the fluctuations in the material, I will be able to fully control the, the thermodynamics of complex material because the energy exchange between the different matter constituents is mediated by fluctuations in the different degrees of freedom. So if I can control the fluctuations on the different degrees of freedom, I can control the thermodynamics of a complex object. So we have developed a, a, a series of tools where we, we combine quantum information protocols with non-equilibrium spectroscopies to try to understand how much or to what extent we can map fluctuations which belong to matter into fluctuations of the light which I can measure. And the idea is that, uh, a, a, I, I skip this part because we are too long, is that I can map fluctuations of the atomic position onto some optical fluctuations and we have uh, developed a, a a series of tools where, uh, uh, which allow us to, 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 to go really inside the material and take out fluctuations which we measure through the light. But I want to skip this part because it's uh, a bit too few of time. And finally, the, the last, uh, the, the, sorry, it's a bit too, I was optimistic with this seminar. So the, the, what this whole story brought us, it brought us to, so on one, on one hand, if we want to induce order from disorder, we need to control fluctuations. So we developed a full set of tools which allow us to measure fluctuations in real time. And uh, the latest effort that we are trying to do, we are trying to develop methodologies to directly control fluctuations. And I think that uh, in this respect, the idea of cavity electrodynamics, which uh, many people are working on in the last uh, few years, it's, uh, it's very interesting because you can control the hybridization between materials and the electromagnetic environment in which these materials are immersed so that essentially you can fully control the, the, the spectra of your object. And we did uh, this, and I just uh, flesh out some result, but we have shown that we can reach strong coupling, but the most interesting aspect is that we took a system in which uh, there is a, a metal insulator transition. So just uh, I do a loop of faith here. Trust me that this is an observable which tells me if the system that I have in the cavity is metallic or insulator. And if I change the temperature, I see that I have a phase transition. This is a specific property of this sample, which I won't discuss here. But there is a phase transition which occurs at a given temperature, and I 
brings my system from a metallic state into an insulating state. The loop of faith, believe me that these features means it's insulator, these features means it's metallic. Now I take the same system, I place it in between an optical cavity, so I place it in between mirrors, and what happens, this phase transition shifts of about 50 Kelvin. Seems like a trivial effect, but that's actually a very profound effect because it actually means that now, if I have a material in between mirrors, I can control whether the material is insulating or metallic just by moving the mirrors around. And we did this, and we have shown that, uh, I give just the main message, we have shown that we can decide if the system is metallic or, in or insulator just by opening and closing the mirror. So we can induce a phase transition between metallic state and insulating state just by closing mirrors. And then I can reverse this transition by opening the mirrors again. So I can control the phase transition by controlling the electromagnetic environment in which the sample is placed in. And that's actually the, the, the latest results of like a cavity-induced phase transition that we can control. And I'll be happy to discuss the, the details of this in the, if you have questions at the end. So the, the idea for us is that we are, uh, a, we come, I, I try to, to give a, in the whole first uh, seminar, I try to give like a very, a very broad, very, very general overview of what, what is the interest in our communities and what are the tools that we use considering that the, the, the crowd is not experts. And the, the, what, uh, what we have, where we are, we are at the stage in which we have a, a giant amount of tools in the sense that we have all the spectroscopics, not, uh, the community developed nearly all the equilibrium spectroscopies that are normally available in condensed matter physics, they are available to, in non-equilibrium format. So I can study the time evolution of the atomic position through X-ray diffraction, electron diffraction. I can study the time evolution of the conductivity through terror spectroscopy. Of, I can study in, in great details everything in, in, uh, of the response of the material. And we are at the stage in which we have all the tools to manipulate the fields that we use to drive. So I've shown that uh, we have all the machinery to produce arbitrary waveform and arbitrary wavelength to drive complex materials. And now it's time to put things together and try to understand how we can control fluctuations and how we can use a, a, a driving to control the thermodynamics of complex materials in this, in this way. And of course, I need to thank all the people who actually did the job that I showed here, and I didn't do anything. OK. Yeah. Thanks a lot. And if you survived until 5, I'm